I'd like to thank the Brazil Initiative and the Watson Institute and a special thank you to Dr. James Green and, and Ramon Stern for um, putting together these series of events and, and inviting me to talk with you. Um, as uh, Dr. Green mentioned, my research uh, started out uh, in Lusophone and Hispanophone Africa, and that is sort of the, uh, the baggage I carry with me as I approach Brazil. Um, and uh, I initially started my work in Brazil hoping to continue the work on prisons. Um, I started with uh, um, um, a community project in, in, in the city of, of Rio. Um, but I found something that caught my eye a little bit more. And it's sort of a, a funny um, anecdote because while living and, and doing field work in Africa, the, the, my whole day was sort of set um, with markers and rhythms of Brazil. The day starts with a novella um, and it ends with a Brazilian novella. Um, all of my favorite products that I discovered that I thought were Cape Verdean or Mozambican turned out to be Brazilian. Um, so Brazil is very present and, and people are very aware of Brazil's influence in Africa. Um, and that wasn't at all the case when I visited Brazil. Uh, people asked me where I had learned Portuguese and it baffled a lot of people that when I answered that it was in Africa. So th this started, uh, started me thinking about uh, these um, the, the way they, they look at each other across the southern Atlantic. So I'll just start off. Um, and actually, in, in true style, I'll start off not talking about Brazil. And I'm going to lower the lights a little bit. So I wish to start off with a bit of a departure from the central topic of this talk to a different continent, community, and material. Uh, these, this, these stills, the series of stills that you will see, are from the 2006 film Juventude de Marcha, uh, Colossal Youth, by Portuguese filmmaker Pedro Costa. This film, which critics have called neither quite fiction nor documentary, is part of a trilogy chronicling the lives of Cape Verdean migrants living in the impoverished community on the outskirts of Lisbon. Um, in this third installment, uh, the plot follows the main character, Ventura, uh, who is seen standing right here, um, who is faced with the demolition of his dilapidated neighborhood of Fontainhas. The stills from this scene take place at the Calusco Benquian Museum, housing uh, Portuguese, uh, Portugal's most impressive and significant art, co art collection. The scene uh, is about seven minutes and is completely absent of dialogue. The camera follows Ventura as he moves about the space. Um, in these st stills, uh, Ventura's positioning in relation to the art pieces and the direction of his gaze violate the norms of the museum. Uh, you see him with his back uh, resting against the painting, um, looking away from the sculptures, and even sitting on furniture. I will return to these images at the end of my talk, um, but for now I'm going to go to the main topic at hand, um, Brazil and Brazil's 21st century re-encounter with Africa. In the first decade of the new millennium, Brazil, Brazilian domestic and foreign policy took a turn toward Africa. The law number 11645 of March 10, 2008 mandated the obligatory teaching of African and Afro-Brazilian history and culture. Actually, I'll turn the lights back on. Okay. Um, mandated the obligatory teaching of African and Afro-Brazilian history and the culture in schools from primary to higher education in both public and private institutions. The language of this law is, no, no, is noteworthy for it specifies the study of, quote, African, uh, history of Africa and Africans, the struggle of blacks and indigenous peoples of Brazil, black and indigenous Brazilian culture, and blacks and Indians in the formation of national society, recovering their contributions in social, economic, political areas pertinent to the history of Brazil." End quote. The aim of this initiative was to highlight the presence of Afro-Brazilians and to valorize their contributions to Brazilian society as a way to combat discrimination and prejudice. Curiously, the legislation also mandates the teaching of the, quote, history of Africa and Africans as pertinent 
to its mission of an inclusive educational system, and I would argue crucial to the reconceptualization of the nation as a diverse, modern, multicultural one. Um, Africa was also a notable priority in Brazilian foreign relations during the Lula administration. In the span of eight years, Lula visited um, 27 different African uh, countries on 12 separate occasions, promoting a so-called South-to-South co cooperation among formerly colonized nations. In 2010, in, Cape Ver in the Cape Verdean archipelago, Lula claimed, quote, I always say that we do not have a way to pay. We do not have a way to measure in money the historical debt that Brazil has with the African continent. Because we are debtors of our way of being, we are debtors of our culture, we are debtors of our art, our color, of the miscegenation of the Brazilian people." End quote. This cultural and racial debt, according to Lula, is to be repaid through a partnership and tutelage. Quote, Brazil trusts Africa. We believe that 800 million of Africans need and can achieve the promise of a region with vast natural riches and extraordinary prospects for growth. I am certain that this meeting will be the seed of a long-standing and productive <coughs> cooperation between Brazil and West Africa." End quote. As Livio Sansoni argues, this discourse represents a shift in narratives about Africa and Brazil's relationship to the continent, placing itself squarely in the matrix of the global south. Though not surprisingly, during this time, also exports from Brazil to the African continent saw an annual growth of 24%. What we see in these two examples is that Africa and African history is deemed essential to understanding its own history and its own diversity. Moreover, under Lula, history is deployed as a political, diplomatic, identitarian, economic, economic tool. From this broad context emerged my initial research questions. What are these representations of African Africans that is deemed so pertinent uh, to Brazilian history, and how are these historical narratives framed? Museums, um, a shift from prisons and a, a less depressing one, um, turned out to be the most suitable and rich spaces for my study. Um, the museum, not just as an edifice, but also as a site of knowledge production, creates the uh, imaginary of the past, present, and the hoped for future. By framing in, and interpreting, excluding or emitting, the museum has the opportunity to create historical narratives and imagery of Africa. Furthermore, as a didactic space or an ideological state apparatus, it imparts and reinforces dominant ide ideology through a site of education, expression, and identification. <coughs> my first site, excuse me, my first site was uh, Museo Afro Brasileiro in uh, Salvador Bahia, and coincidentally, this year it celebrates its 35th anniversary. The Mafra was inaugurated in 1982 by its first director, Ida Pessoa de Castro after an accord that was struck among the Ministries of Foreign Affairs and Education, Education and Culture of Brazil, the Government of Bahia, the City of Salvador, and the Federal University of Bahia. It houses Bahia's most important collection, including wood, carving, wood carvings, baskets, pottery, and other artwork, and crafts linking Brazilian and African artistic traditions. The highlight of the museum um, is a room lined with uh, carved wooden panels by Argentine-born Caribe, one of Salvador's most regarded artists. The institution, quote, presents content that facilitates <coughs> the understanding of the historic and artistic and ethnographic aspects that identify African societies and allows for a reflection on the importance for the development of Brazilian society. And this mission comes from, from the museum itself. <coughs> The museum is, is a rather modest space of four halls housing a permanent exhibition guiding visitors chronologically. The first uh, section panel is dedicated to pre-colonial Africa and a brief, con uh, brief explanation of the topography of the continent. A panel addresses the history of slavery from the 16th to 19th century with a dedicated section panel on the impacts of trafficking of enslaved peoples to specifically the region of Bahia. Lastly, one panel is dedicated to colonial Africa and contemporary Africa, culminating with a brief statement on the resistance movements overthrowing colonialism in the 1950s and 60s. And here I found it curious that um, it 
did not account for the independences that were fought for and won by Lusophone African countries, Cabo Verde, uh, Guinea-Bissau, São Tomé, Príncipe, Angola, and Mozambique, which were achieved only in 1975. The collection includes wooden sculptures, masks, ceramics, and metallurgy. The last halls are dedicated to Afro-Brazilian arts, specifically the representation of orishas. In addition to the permanent collection in an interview, coordinator Graça Teixeira explained the Institute's objective as working toward, quote, establishing a dialogue with the cultures of African countries. And this I was able to witness in person in 2014. I was able to see an example of this dialogue with the temporary exhibit entitled O Patrimonio Laços Ancestrais para a Unidade dos Povos da Diáspora África, Bahia, Brasil, or the Heritage Ancestral Ties for the Unity of Diasporic People, Africa, Bahia, and Brazil. The exhibit was, among, was a cooperation among the Senegalese government, local Bahian cultural associations, the, some Bahian city governments, and included a caravan of Senegalese craftspeople visiting Bahia. They, they toured um, some, some cities. Um, the, the main panel uh, was entitled Arts and Riches of African Crafts. And it features brief biographies. And here I have examples of two um, craftsperson. And here I'm using the, the words uh, um, and the terms by, by the curation. Um, so a brief biographies of six Senegalese craft persons and the significance of their work. Their crafts, um, here translating artisanato, quote, revealed the creativity and grandiosity of traditional knowledge. Thereby they communicate identitary language, fruit of the African everyday, end quote. In the curation of the exhibit, taxonomy is a salient concept. In other words, I'm concerned here with how contemporary pieces by Senegalese artists are framed and categorized. The distinction between art versus craft is a crucial choice for the distinction made um, between artisanato meaning craft or artisan meaning craft person are ideologically laden terms, especially when contrasted with <coughs> art, art or artista artist. According to Suzanne Preston Blair, this difference stems from colonialism. Quote, conceptually, this reinforces the distinction which has been made historically between African arts, which are assumed to be materially oriented, EI artifacts, and European arts, which are as seen to be manifestations of the mind. How African art is defined and not defined vis-a-vis -vis larger science system taxonomies of art versus craft, primitive versus non-primitive labeling, presentation in natural history versus fine art museums, um, and here I would say versus ethnograph ethnographic museums, and colonial definitions of internal style of boundaries <coughs> is fundamental to one's perception of these works, end quote. The pieces are characterized, quote, as, quote, ample and diversified. The articles range from garments to day-to-day -day utensils, and this is the curation, um, the, one of the section panels. Emphasizing their technique um, and their quotidian utility. In fact, there is no mention of conceptual work or even innovation. Historically, craft, especially in the colonial African context, has been associated with primitivism, thereby perpetuating the idea of an allochronic Africa, here referring to Fabian's term, positing Africa in the past, stagnant and, in, and immutable in its temporality. Through hierarchy, hierarchical taxonomies, contemporary Africa, as represented by a select group of artists and designers from Senegal, create and perpetuate the notions of an ancestral and a homogenous Africa as a referential baseline for di uh, diasporic, com diasporic communities. For Susan Pierce, this would exemplify fetishistic collecting, quote, the removal of the object from its historical context and its redefinition in terms of the collector, end quote. Contemporary Senegalese designers are then reformulated as a glimpse into the past and quoting from the exhibition so that the public can move closer to the traditional knowledge of this great nation, end quote. So here I would like to leave you with this idea um, that these uh, contemporary um, designers or craftspeople are then a glimpse into an ancient history. From uh, Salvador, uh, I traveled south to Sao Paulo, and it's really quite impressive uh, museum, Museo Afro-Brazil, 
Um, located in, in Sao Paulo's I Ibirapuera Park, the Museo Afro Brazil uh, is dedicated to research, preservation, and exhibition of around 6,000 items including African and Afro-Brazilian cultural pieces. The museum also offers a range of cultu cultural and educational activities, contemporary exhibitions, and houses a theater and library. The permanent collections represent diverse uh, topics such as religion, labor, slavery, and the African diaspora. The institution is crucial in collecting, affirming, and exhibiting the historical tra trajectory and the African influences in the construction of Brazilian society. This institution is fairly new. It was inaugurated in 2004 and is uh, the initiative by the artist and curator Emanuela Rauch that, who, that has evolved in, into the largest collection of Afro-descendant art in South America and most important cultural space for recognition and valorization of Afro or African descendant heritage in Brazil. And here I'd, I'd like to take a little bit of a parenthesis and point out that uh, both Mafro and Salvador and MAB, uh, Museo Afro Brazil in, in Sao Paulo, are invaluable in their work um, as institutions fighting against racism and discrimination and fighting for the recognition and the value of Afri Afro Brazilian culture, which is still a, a, a long fight um, within Brazilian society. Um, even though in, recent census, in a recent census, uh, over half of Brazilians um, have, have been shown to have black or mixed heritage, representations of, of Brazilian culture is still strikingly whitewashed. Um, and a space like uh, the Museo Afro-Brazil is crucial to affirming of positive contributions of Afro-Brazilians to Brazilian society. Furthermore, secondary school groups are frequent visitors to the museum to learn and discuss ideas of slavery and racism um, in, in a nation which is still holding on to the idea of a racial democracy. Um, and so it's, it's an important space of contention of national and dominant discourses. Um, and in, in this context, the work of the museum to collect and, and display African and Afro-Brazilian art is a destabilizing force um, against the dominant white or mestizo culture. But I wish to focus on another temporary exhibit at the Museo Afro-Brazil, which ran from May to August 2014. The exhibition entitled Espírito da África, Os Reis Africanos, The Spirit of Africa, African Kings, is an extensive work of Austrian photographer Alf Alfred Weidinger, uh, pro his project from his project entitled The Last Kings of Africa. In a series of black and white and color portraits of royalty kings, princes, um, who Weidinger encountered while traveling in various sub-Saharan African um, countries, um, he described these photographs as an exploration of the contemporary importance and relevance of ancient royal families in the government of contemporary nation states. And here I'm quoting the artist and to show you another striking image. Quote, some countries put the monarch <coughs> system back into the constitution. They give power to the traditional leaders depending on how local governments in Africa develop. They'll either figure, become figures for tourists or they'll continue to play an important role, end quote. The central question of Weidinger's um, show is to um, see the contemporary relevance of ancient political institutions, especially with mass migrations to large urban centers, um, threatening to weaken their power and their resilience in the face of this. The curation work at the Museo of Brazil constructed quite a different narrative of these photographs. The section panel read, quote, the exhibit has a great significance for an ancestral history and memory, given that these tribal leaders no longer have political power. But in their decorative essence, they are counselors, remembering the memory of an Africa perversely undone by new territorial divisions that united diverse ethnicities." End quote. The, through the interpretation work of the curator at the Museo of Brazil, the Chief and the chiefs and the political readers are embodiments of ancestral and pre-colonial memory, whereas the artist himself focuses on the active participation and adaptation of ancient forms of government in contemporary nation states uh, and tourist economies. The the Museo Afro Brazil looks at African kingdoms as relegated to the past, relics of a fetishized past. <coughs> 
Africa is constructed spatially as frozen in this past, denied of its coevalness and modernity. Mikbal argues that all narratives are told by a narrative agent, a narrator with a subject, subjective point of view inevitably influencing our interpretation of them, making, quote, all narratives by definition more or less fiction, end quote. Both suggest understanding collecting as a narrative then, um, allowing for the questioning of chronology. In collecting, the beginning is marked by the first piece. Yet this acquisition becomes the first piece in the collection only retrospectively after, quote, narrative manipulation of sequence of events, end quote, which makes this piece the point of origin. Quote, beginning instead is not a, it's not, is, beginning instead is a meaning, not an act, end quote. So Weidinger's photographs are interpreted as representing a narrative genesis or an origin of Afro-Brazilian communities. In society where Brazilian community is struggling for recognition, working, uh, evoking images of, of pre-colonial African societies with powerful kingdoms and complex forms of government provide a sense of value and legitimacy to contemporary African Afro-Brazilian culture. While these discourses aim to valorize both pre-colonial African history and contemporary Afro-Brazilian Afro -Brazilian cultures, they also construct stunted temporality whereby Africa only exists in the past as a place of origin, the cradle of Afro-Brazilian culture. And to paraphrase Eugenia Ana Santos, uh, Bahia, and I would say by extension Africa is the black room. However, contemporary African cultures are not put in dialogue with contemporary Afro-Brazilian discourses. The idea of Africa and above all African, Africans, uh, African so-called primitive art as origin and a glimpse into the past is nothing new. Such discourse has its own history as Susan Vogel explains, quote, African artifacts were seen as providing a precious glimpse into the past of human development, the dawn of consciousness, the root of art, as the word primitive implies. However, what is at stake and what is gained from perpetuating notions of a pure, authentic, monolithic, uh, ancestral Africa in, in contemporary Brazil? Jean Baudrillard argues that the sign value of an object is not based on its functional benefit, rather its symbolic value within a system of objects. Quote, a diamond ring may have no function at all but it may suggest particular social values such as taste or class, end quote. The sign value of Africanity in these spaces is characterized by a spatial and temporal tension of Afro-Brazilian present and as it's contingent upon the African past. Specifically, African art is valuable for the legitimation and recognition of Afro-descendant communities in Brazil. Africa particularly um, as an ancestral mother, motherland is a sign value of Brazilian modernity and progress and, and is how Brazilian modernity and progress is constructed and contrasted and reiterated against its primitive traditional past. In the reflection of Africa, Brazil constructs its own evolution, its own narrative of progress, thus, thus its own modernity. And briefly, I want to return and remind you of where we started with Ventura. Oops, that's wrong. So I wish to return to the beginning of this presentation to Ventura, who seemingly unconcerned with the valuable pieces of art, leans up against the paintings and sits on the furniture exhibited at the museum. His gaze is aimed away from the artwork, is directed towards the walls of the museum, He's in fact admiring the building, the bare walls. Ventura, and this is in fact true, Ventura came to Portugal as a migrant worker working on the construction crew responsible for erecting this building in the 1960s. Ventura's visit to the museum was to admire his own work and to return to the site where he had suffered a traumatic brain injury, uh, a worksite injury, leaving him mentally incap incap incapacitated and uh, unable to work. Ventura's disregard for the valuable art and the tacit norms of the museum space works to destabilize, albeit mere, for a mere moment, dominant historical narratives and ideological apparatus, the ideological apparatus of the museum. The spectator can no longer divorce the site, spelled S-I-G-H-T, from the site, S-I-T-E, 
The sites or visuals curated to prove the narrative of European civilization are in tension with the site, S-I-T-E, or the museum edifice built by forced migrant labor from the African colonies. Um, so this work is very much an exploration and a work in progress, and I do not wish to offer finite conclusions, rather more open-ended questions and maybe even provocations. Um, so returning back to Lula, in 2010, he gave his last speech on the African continent in Maputo, Mozambique. Quote, Brazilian people, what they are, happy, beautiful, full of swing, samba, carnival, and football loving. Because of our miscegenation and the extraordinary mix between Africans, indigenous peoples, and Europeans. This, in fact, should be our strength compared to the rest of the world. But because our minds colonized for centuries, we were taught that we were inferior. <coughs> when we make a choice for Africa, we want to stand up and lift our heads together. We want to build together a future in which the South is not weaker than the North, not dependent on the future, a future in which we believe in ourselves, we can, just be, we can be just as important and smart as they are." End quote. Lula's speech constructs a relationship of a shared post-colonial history among the nations of the Global South. The cultural proximity and affinity is owed to Brazil's long history of uh, cultural and racial miscegenation and a post-colonial mindset. The language, uh, for me as an Africanist, is reminiscent of lusotropicalism, an ideology loosely expressed by Gilberto Freire and then reappropriated and deployed by the Salazar dictatorship, really uh, starting in the 1950s, um, earlier, but really mainly in the 1950s, um, in Portugal to disavow colonialism and economic exploitation in the African colonies, arguing that their relationship was characterized by affect, fraternity, a common history, based on a heritage of racial and cultural miscegenation. So we see common uh, trends between these two discourses. This ideological tool justified Portuguese imperialism in Africa well into the 1970s. Um, and here, I guess uh, it's maybe a provocation. To what extent can we think of Brazil's South-to-South -South partnership with Africa in terms of a neoliberal reformulation of lusotropicalism? Lastly, I wish to question the idea of commodification of, of Africanity or the idea of culture as resources put forth by George Yudis. Um, and this is something that the, this uh, scene from Ventura had me thinking. The, the Museo Afro Brasileiro in Salvador, if anybody has been there, is, is located but tucked away within the historic and touristic uh, district of Pelourinho, which is a type of uh, open air museum or if even an open air sort of amusement park, if you will. Um, and it's, it's full of performance of Afro-Brazilian Afro identity, uh, largely for foreign tourist consumption. Um, the, patrimon the patrimonization of the district as a UNESCO World Heritage Site has revitalized commerce and tourism at the expense of poor, largely black communities who inhabited the neighborhood. Um, of course, gentrification. The, the Bayanas, black Brazilian women, dressed to evoke painfully violent histories, dissociating them from their historical reference and allowing for their consumption. Um, as cultural geographer Milton Santos argued, Bahia, and I claim specifically Pelourinho, is a palimpsest. The museum and the streets of, of Pelourinho exist in a state of historical tension between past and present. And so I'll end here and take your comments. Thank you. You should feel free to just call the people. Okay. Yes. Um, so at the end, I didn't fully understand your provocation about Lula is seeming to reproduce both reproduce uh, Lucio tropicalism and the idea of racial democracy brings brings link between Brazil and Africa. At the same time, he's proposing something that goes beyond the way in which Ferry thought of the hierarchy of you know, European, African, and Indian mixed up, but still the hierarchy. So he, he's really talking about a power which is South to South, which kind of flips the European dominance of the Ferrarian model, it seems to me. Um, it, what, could you talk a little bit more about this tension between 
kind of a Frarian post Frarian build upon Frarian idea of, of Africa and what might be an alternative to that, which is not neoliberal. I mean, I, I got confused because you said something about a neoliberal alternative, and, which might be what the new government will try to do. The new government in Brazil now is withdrawing from Africa, saying it's a waste of money and resources, and it's closing down embassies. Um, so the neoliberal project doesn't seem to be finding Africa as a means for building linkages and investments and possibilities of Brazil being a patron and a father of the modernity, but, but abandoning Africa. So I'm, I'm just, if you could mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that kind of tension that's going on. Uh, I mean, you pose really interesting questions. This is something I have to consider more. Um, so Lula uh, described this this cooperation one way as a cooperation as a parceria, right, a partnership, um, and uh, not so much Freire, but its reappropriation of Freire within the Salazar government is very much a, a non-hierarchical, and, and they, they specifically say that in the 1950s, that Portuguese colonialism in Africa is not at all hierarchical. It's based on an affect fraternity and that the African countries uh, belonging to Portugal were renamed as provinces because they all belonged to a multicultural and multiracial nation. Um, and based on this, uh, this past history of miscegenation, which is also something that, that in this speech Lula picks up on. Um, I, I will have to think more about this. Maybe neoliberalism isn't the, the right word, but there is some kind of reformulation of, of this kind of idea happening across the South Atlantic where there is a hierarchy present and that we cannot deny it. Let me, let me follow up. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's true that Salazar takes Ferry uses in Africa, but Ferry participates in that process and he gets to, uh, awarded for that and goes to Portugal and lectures and is used. And so, even though they're denying hierarchy, the hierarchy is there. I mean, right. it's, it's a lie. It's, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a colonial lie that they're pre presenting to package Portugal as, a, as a, a benign, benevolent imperial power that is doing benefits and that everything is fine and there's no repression or anything. So it's a, it's a nefarious ideology. It's rooted in Freire's ideas, which kind of overlook the hierarchy in Brazil as well. <laughs> Lula as many other leaders of his generation that haven't been a part of the academic world to criticize Ferry, mm -hmm. even Jilma, to a certain extent, is confused on this thing when she was talking this last week, are reproducing that in my mind as well. But Lula undercuts it at the same time by this look to Africa in a very different way um, than seeing really as, as in other words, taking a face, taking appropriating part of it as saying this is authentically <coughs> egalitarian and we're going to share. At the same time he's using a discourse which is which is a neocolonial discourse. So I, I guess that's what I'm trying to get, get at and it's a, it's a very contradictory dilemma. Yes, I, I definitely yeah. agree. If I can, if I can yes. chip in, I mean I stand by our use of neoliberalism there. I think mm -hmm. even if the, I mean, everything is still up in the air, but we know that Odebrecht and others were, for instance, putting pressure for this type of collaboration, right? So there is an element of uh, colonialism, and an element of free market going on there that, Absolutely. I mean, it's still to be seen where it's going to take us, but... I, yes, yeah, so opening up uh, markets in Africa for, for Brazilian consumption, and then also the vast network of NGOs um, that, that work in Africa, that are Brazilians that are coming, is, is um, Lula flat out denies imperialism. But, but there is a, a, a question of, of inequality happening, yeah. I and think. I mean, American imperialism also had uh, this idea for friendship with Latin America, right. for instance, right? Really and it happens through the cultural, but also through sort of an economic undercurrent. Yeah. May, may I, may I debate so I, I think you're right, and I totally agree with you. And, and it, is a, it is, on one hand, it's a neoliberal project of Lula aligned with entrepreneurs and major construction companies like Odebrecht to take advantage of Africa, and that's something that they're thinking about <coughs> in the 60s and guys will think about in the 70s. But at the same time, it's contradictory because at the same time, it's a South-to-South -South cooperation, which is political, which is making an argument about the traditional ways of power. Perhaps it's restructuring Brazil as a new colonial or neo-colonial power vis-a-vis -vis Africa, but it's, it's at the same time challenging the global north. So it's a contradictory 
thing that it, Lou is it doing. It is. It is absolutely because it decenters the north, right? So it's a new new power relation that we are seeing. But in this case, again, the parallel between the Portuguese imperial. Um, force in the, in the in the 20th century also applies because Portugal had this this in between this ambivalent as Boaventura Santos calls this ambivalent position of being colonized within Europe sort of being the other within Europe and then otherizing in Africa and so I think that that's some some something that I still don't have words for, but there's something of that going on in Brazil, where it is a new set of power relations, where the, the global north is no longer at its center, but it's still not uh, uh, directly eye to eye or egalitarian by any means. Thank you. I, I think, uh, just a, a, a comment, I think one of the things that um, your presentation is bringing to light is is the 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 um, contrast between the discursive framing of the relationship to Africa and possible progressive components to that discursive framing, but then the actual material and and and, and cultural implications of, of that kind of framing, which don't mat match match up as as we may want them to, and um, and and I think it's a really really important point. We also had a presentation from. I think it was Paul Amar a while back about about the relationship between Brazil and um, was it was it the Middle East um, and and looking at Brazil as a as a as, as a player that's not just part of the global south but that's that's using its power in different ways in different parts of the world and I think it's really important to remember that in when when we talk about Brazil to not just see Brazil as part of the global south part of the quote developing world that's that, that doesn't have power to yield in these kinds of relationships. Um, so I, I'm really grateful to you for, for, for shedding some light on those, on those issues and bringing them up. Yes. Hi, I apologize for being late. Um, and this is my first time here in, in this forum. I just drove down from Boston and I didn't anticipate the traffic quite well. Um, I'm curious about your discipline. And I, I'll tell you why. I'm, 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 my, my work is focused, I'm an academic, and my work is focused on development. But I'm a system scientist. My PhD is in socio-technical systems. And I have a very different approach, which all those people, which economists who hate me will, <coughs> will explain. And uh, I hear different perspectives in here. It doesn't quite sound like you're a sociologist, and you're not economists. You know, I, I spent the last five years as a visiting scholar at Cornell Institute for African Development, and I saw a lot of government and public affairs people, and a lot of, um, what would you call them? Economists, you know, the World Bank people. And I understand those perspectives very well, but I hear something different, and it would be helpful for me to understand where you're all coming from. I, I'm an historian. I work on Brazilian uh, history. That's what it sounds like. Um, right. I don't know our colleague here who just spoke. I work in the... Comparative literature. Comparative and, I'm Brazilian, so. mm. and Ramon spoke. Yeah, I, I uh, studied comparative literature. Got my got my PhD in comparative literature. Work here at the Brazilian Institute now. And I, I did my PhD in literature, but I look at um, historical narratives, so it's more of a cultural mm -hmm. studies framework. And, and so one of the ideas of the Brazil Initiative has been to, um, we have a very strong core Department of Portuguese and Brazilian Studies here, there's a strong tradition in literature and cultural studies, was to create a synergy among people across the disciplines to think about Brazil in many different ways, on many different themes. This year has been focusing a lot on Afro-Brazilian traditions in Africa and Africa and, and, and inviting scholars working on that a lot to kind of look at the African diaspora and Afro descendants of Brazil as one specific focus, although we have many different interests and focus in that, in that regard. My contribution was a new discipline, which I call social enterprise systems engineering. So I'm integrating large scale engineering, large scale multi, large scale interdisciplinary engineering, and development into design of um, social entrepreneurship structures that can reach into the tens of billions of dollars. And um, at the time I finished my <laughs> dissertation on this, two years ago, there was nothing that existed. Now, um, 
UC Berkeley has a engineering design for development and their increasing number of engineering design for development programs growing, springing up. And uh, there's a fundamental difference to the way we think than economists think. It's not necessarily policy oriented. And I was hearing something even in some ways deeper. You're talking about fundamental perception. Uh, fund worldview beliefs seems to be the... I mean, we are coming more or less from an ideological critique. Or an historical critique. Did, I, did you? I wanted to follow a question, unless you had a question. To, yeah. So, um, your 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 presentation, of your, your new research project, which is a very interesting one, which is kind of looking at the constructions of Africa in Brazil and as they're understood. And you give the examples of the museums. And um, so, what I'm and the law that requires there to be studying. So there's a whole anxiety in academia of whether they can produce professors who can teach African history. I'm, I'm very curious to know in, in your observation of that, how are people looking at contemporary Africa? Because what you've emphasized now is the glimpses into the past, the roots of Brazil and its, and its diasporic origins and slavery, but how are people trying to make sense of um, contemporary Africa, which to the non-expert outsider in the way Africa is framed in the West is this is a continent in meltdown that is constantly in a conflict with many, many problems and, and violence and civil wars and unrest and economic problems. How, how, are, how are Brazilians, or is, this a, is there a silence around that? Because it, it seems like there might be a silence around the, the contemporary, or, or if there is a, a, a discussion, how is it framed? Uh, that's an excellent question, and where I'm at at this moment, um, I think it has a lot to do with Ramon's commentary previously, is that I, I'm looking at, at um, state-sanctioned san spaces, so official spaces. Um, and in these spaces, there is um, th this very progressive movement, of course, to uh, incorporate Afro-Brazilians and make them visible and make them as a valuable part of, of society but at the expense of any space for Africa to exist in, in the same time, the same temporality as Afro-Brazilians. So Africa is always this past that is sort of their um, civilization, their Rome, um, that, that they, they can draw on. But Africa cannot coexist with this discourse in, in the, the contemporary period. At, at this, to answer your question, um, beyond just that it's a silence, because I, I don't think that that's necessarily um, um, the case. I would have to continue work, and I, I suspect that it would be in places that are, um, that are alternative, um, that are maybe interventions, or um, that are um, not uh, established institutions. That, that is my guess. Um, because with Brazil's intervention economically in Africa, there's also always a, 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 a sort of a secondary um, movement where a lot of Africans are coming to Brazil. And it's very, very visible. Um, it's just a matter of going in that direction uh, for the future of this project. And for that, I, I appreciate that comment. Yes? Uh, from the Brazilian perspective, how much is Portuguese the language a barrier to interacting with Africa? Is there a lot of interaction beyond Portuguese speaking Africa? For example, I know a lot about what China is doing in Africa and how they handle the language differences. I don't know what their general perspective and toolkit is in Brazil. For economic exchanges or in the museum space? Um, Every, everything, economic exchange. Um, in, in uh, as far as cooperations go, I think that the the Portuguese speaking African nations, the Palop, is very important, but by no means is it the, the only. Um, and in, in the museum spaces, it's actually more 
uh, where Brazilians can trace their roots. So it's more <coughs> around the Gulf of Guinea, West Africa, um, and especially because uh, those places, Benin, Nigeria, also have returned communities where uh, uh, Afro-Brazilians return and establish themselves. So it's more of an ancestral link of origins. Um, I think in cooperation, it's very, Mozambique is a, is a big place for, for Brazilian NGOs or cooperations or economic um, initiatives, but it's, it's, uh, it's spread out all over the sub-Saharan continent. languages covered and additionally the local embassies assist cooperation missions and so they usually work directly with uh, local governments. And we have 30 embassies in the continent that was, I mean, that's not, there are only five colonies or ex-colonies or four. Mm -hmm. So it meant being in former colonies of Francophone and Anglophone colonies as well. And I mean this is a big debate because Lula was considered to have been very foolish to have wasted um, the resources of the country by opening these embassies that are very expensive and to maintain them. And now that they're being cut back, what I think have they closed down some no. of them? They haven't closed them. There's a discuss about discussion about that, but they haven't been closed. There's been a lot of you know questioning of whether this was a, a wise event, whether there were nefarious reasons for this. Was it just to, <coughs> to be a vehicle to do investment of large scale uh, multinational corporations? based in Brazil, in Africa, for construction projects? Was this just a way of, of uh, helping certain Brazilian companies to do well in Africa? Or is there, is there a more important ideological position on that? And I, I didn't realize that they hadn't cut any of them down. That was certainly yeah. Serra's proposal to do that. They have a, an ongoing discussion on it, but there has been no decision to cut yeah. any of the embassies. If not, thank you very much thank for coming. You. Thank you.